Hi there, my name is Mora Onyonka and I'm a Corporate Development Manager within Silicon Valley Bank and I sit on the Access to Innovation team and I'm located here in the heart of Bed-Stuy, my favorite of all favoritest of neighborhoods within Brooklyn, so welcome. I just wanna say that on behalf of Silicon Valley Bank, we are so proud to sponsor Startup Grind and the SG's Women's Summit this year to join in celebrating and empowering women entrepreneurs and investors. Through our initiative, Access to Innovation, we are always working to advance women, Black, and Latinx individuals to positions of power and influence within the innovation economy. And we're able to do this through many different ways, like increasing the pipeline of diverse you know, talent to our clients with powerful partnerships, connecting diverse groups to SVB's vast network within the innovation economy, and three, unlock or greater access to capital, professional relationships, and career opportunities that underrepresented minority groups may not have historically had. We are always aiming to be that source and that catalyst for good within the sector. Um, and we understand that it is because of diverse perspectives, inclusive environments that really aim to ignite beautiful, big, bold, audacious um, ideas. And so we invite you to learn more about Silicon Valley Bank and about our Access to Innovation program and initiative by visiting www.svb.com backslash access. Thank you again and welcome. Um, today we have uh, Candace Morgan from, who's the equity, diversity and inclusion partner at Google Ventures. Uh, Chauncey Hamilton, who's a partner at XYZ Ventures, and Sheena Jindal, who's a partner at Comcast Ventures. And then I'm Jen Wolf. Um, I'm a president and partner at Initialized uh, Capital. So um, just a little bit of what this panel is about today. You know, we're going to talk about uh, diversifying your cap table and the reasons why you should, uh, how you should do it, and, and when you should do it. And then we hope to uh, leave you with some actionable ways to incorporate diversity into your companies, your cultures, your products. And, you know, in the theme of the, the whole, I think the day in the conference is, you know, why it's important to have that, that perspective from, from day one. So I'm going to, um, we're going to go around and each person can maybe introduce themselves um, and, uh, and where they're from. And then um, I'll, I'll sort of give a little context before we jump into the questions. So I'll start with uh, Candice first. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, and thank you, Jen. So excited to be part of this conversation. Um, what a, what awesome, awesome company and what a timely conversation. Um, uh, as Jen said, I, I lead equity, diversity, and inclusion at GV. Um, and when I got a ping um, sometime in the summer of 2019 about this role, uh, I was like, I've never seen this. What What is this? There's, a, you know, what, how do we think about equity, diversity, and inclusion in the context of venture capital in a full-time role. And, um, and, you know, and I asked them a number of questions, but what essentially the role is, is a combination of uh, really helping our firm push on our strategy and vision for what it means to be a truly equitable um, venture firm uh, and who we hire and who we fund. How do we think about the diversity of the dollars we are deploying to underrepresented founders in 2020, about a, a quarter uh, a quarter of a billion dollars went to underrepresented founders and, and we surpassed that in 2021, but like why, how, how do we sustain that? <laughs> um, and then also how do we advise startups at the earliest stages? So throughout my career, you know, I started at uh, Catalyst, a nonprofit that uh, just hit its 60th anniversary um, where I was working with big Fortune 500 companies um, uh, both based on Wall Street and, and based in Europe. And, uh, and then I went to Pinterest and led diversity for four years. I moved out to San Francisco in 2015 and um, joined the company, um, you know, at a growth stage pre-revenue, um, you know, as a pre-revenue startup and spent four years there through IPO. Um, and now I'm working with sometimes companies we've incubated that is, you know, a couple of people. And it's really awesome to, to have the privilege to do this diversity work that early. But part of the work is, is, picking our heads up from all of the daily work that we're doing and how, and moving forward together as an industry, no one firm can 
can really push all of us. Um, so I spend a lot of time out in the ecosystem partnering with amazing organizations, um, obviously Startup Grind giving us this, this conversation today, but other organizations as well. I'll be at the All Race Summit next week um, so that we can raise awareness and, and push the industry together. Thanks, Candice. That was an awesome intro, and I'm sure we're going to touch on a little bit more of all those topics in the, in the panel in a moment as well. All right, I'll go to Chauncey next. Um, she and I have known each other for a while, but I'll, I'll let her introduce herself. Thanks so much, John, and thanks so much for including me in this. Um, it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart, so I'm very excited to have uh, this discussion and with such incredible women on the panel. Um, and thank you also, Startup Brian, for hosting this and making it an important part of your conference. Um, so my name is Chauncey Hamilton. I'm a partner at XYZ. My whole career has been around early stage technology and startups. I started my career at Wired in the media world, where I got to see incredible people building and changing the world through startups, but was a little more on the sidelines and the media lens um, and got the bugs to move over to venture in 2013 when I joined First Round Capital as a chief of staff to one of the investors there, Rob Hayes. He wrote checks into Uber and TaskRabbit and Planet Labs. And I got to work with him for about five years as an apprenticeships type uh, role. And then I moved over to Dorm Room Fund, which is a student run venture fund that first round is the sole LP in and got to work with a lot of incredible undergrads and graduate students across the country on investing in uh, student run startups. I went to many more 21st birthday parties like, than I care to admit as a 30 year old mother, but <laughs> it was a really fun um, time to just see what students care about and what they were investing in. And then in early 2020, I um, moved over to XYZ with my partner, Ross Fubini, and have been investing here in the last two years. Um, and so that's me. Thanks for having me. All right, Sheena, why don't you take us home on the intros? <laughs> this is wonderful. Thanks so much for hosting and for having us. Excited for the conversation today. Um, I'm Sheena. I'm a partner over at Comcast Ventures. Um, pretty, pretty traditional path into venture. Started my career at BCG, spent some time working in corporate strategy and consumer at Saks Fifth Avenue, and then headed off uh, to join a Series B startup um, and got the investing bug a couple of years ago and have been loving every minute since. Um, so Comcast Ventures is a early stage um, investing platform. We invest across consumer and enterprise, um, writing lead checks anywhere from a couple hundred thousand up to about 10 million. Um, I'm excited to be here today. Great, thanks so much. So I was going to, um, you know, read some 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 stats first before we jump into it, just to give us some context. I think, um, you know, Candice started touching on some of these points in her intro, but you know, as of uh, the end of 2019, only 12 percent of general partners at venture capital firms were women, and there were only about you know 740 female angel investors. Um, today, women make up about 15 percent of general partners at venture capital firms. And there's around more closer to a thousand, you know, female angel investors, you know, uh, not surprisingly, uh, female founders raised just 2% of venture capital money in, in 2021, which was a bonkers year for, <laughs> for raising money. And, and, you know, the second year in a row that women's percentage of VC funding shrank. Um, and then um, in 2020, 93% of firms had no uh, black partners. And um, despite the fact uh, that there was a, a record uh, $147 billion invested in US startups in the first half of 2021, only 1.2% 1 uh, went to black founders. So I think the, the point here that, that we've all touched on is that you know, people investing in the companies and the founders are, are building our future. And you know, a lot of that doesn't, you know, doesn't today reflect the, the makeup of of who we are in our population. So, you know, we want to talk about that blind spot and, you know, how we, how we can, you know, start to correct that and make everything and make, make, you know, how we, what companies we fund and who's funding these companies, um, you know, be more representative and allow us to build a better future for all of us. And, you know, really key way to do this is to have more women and underrepresented minorities get into venture capital. So, um, I guess we're, so we're going to kick off the panel now. <laughs> um, I guess, let's see. Okay, we've gone through the first two. So, you know, I guess uh, actually, Candace, we'll, we'll take the first question uh, to you. you know, sort of, 
in a business based really on networks and relationships, it's you know very easy to stay inside your network, just the people you know. And I know I was even reading your bio on the on the GB site. You know, this is something you, you really specialize in, and I was like, this this sounds amazing because this is like one of the hardest parts <laughs> uh, of of you know expanding one's network. So maybe what what concrete things can VCs do to you know expand their network and and why? Yeah, I mean, I think you've already um, kind of listed with with those statistics, right? How um, in some sense, how insular the, the networks are that lead to these funding gaps, right? Um, I think Crunchbase just released something this week um, around which schools, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, VCs went to, and it's heavily concentrated in a very small handful of schools. Um, and uh, I, there was a study that came out a couple of years ago done by uh, Richard Kirby, who's now at Equal Ventures, um, that of um, particularly underrepresented venture partners, 50% um, of them went to one of two schools, right? 40% um, overall went to one of two schools. Um, and I think it's pretty obvious where we're, where we're talking about. And so, um, you know, by design, you know, humans are extremely relational and um, we like to think we're super objective, especially being in a business where you need to make objective decisions about uh, growth potential, founder and team potential, market, um, product market fit potential, right? Um, we really like to feel like the decision make that that objective decision making quote unquote transfers um, to how we hire people, how we build teams internally to firms, and obviously that is that is not the case. It's very much who you know. Most firms still don't post open jobs. Um, or roles. I know like KPOR has done that a lot. I know first round posted some IP roles, um, but it's still unusual to even know when there is an opening. Um, that's from the joining a firm side. And then if you're an entrepreneur, same thing, like how to pitch. And in fact, you know, um, I don't need to tell anyone really on the panel, but I, um, if you, in, you know, for, for those listening, sometimes it's, you know, it's a badge of honor for the founder, oh, if they couldn't find a way to get connected into our networks, uh, then that's that's a strike against them, and maybe they're not they don't have that founder potential. So it, we kind of rationalize this um, this you know behavior of proximity um, based relationships. Same thing on boards. Obviously, there's been a ton of movement around board diversity, but it's generally I know a guy from my other board, um, and you know, <laughs> gender, um, you know, um, you know. Obviously, there's not as much gender diversity, although we are starting to see some change. I think that, though, the good news is you do start to hear having these conversations across firms that people do want to expand their network. Um, and there are a couple of reasons for that and business reasons for that, in addition to obviously it reflecting more of um, where innovation is coming from. The, you know, there are a lot of studies around diversity and profitability. The relationship hasn't fully been. Um, you know, the, there's a lot of research that's gone into it, and a lot of correlation research. But at the end of the day, the data shows that more diversity means more innovation if it's well managed. That's the other thing. A lot of times, you even if you get representatives in different places, let's say that you start building up your network of hiring junior investors, but those folks don't really have an impact on bringing in new investment areas, um, then you're really not going to reap the benefits of that diversity. Um, so I think that the important place to start is in firms, one understanding that there is a business aspect to missing out on new and emerging markets. Um, and I think that, you know, web, we were just talking about Web3. Web3 is a really great example where already um, we're not seeing a ton of diversity, although there's a lot of interest and there's a lot of um, socioeconomic, I would say in some cases, diversity and participation, we're not seeing a lot of, um, you know, uh, as much diversity as we expect. We almost see some replication of what we've seen in the venture industry. So um, there's a business reason that we won't be able to move into new markets, despite the fact that women and women of color in particular are the fastest um, growing groups of entrepreneurs. But that those businesses often aren't venture back because people making the venture decisions, especially the senior GPs, uh, five out of six of them, if not more, are men. Um, so I think that's the main thing. And then the second thing is like, how do you build those networks? You can do it in so many, so many different ways. I mean, we were hiring um, for our, um, our life sciences team. And particularly, we were looking for some biotech positions. So uh, we definitely had our work cut out for us in terms of starting to build some networks um, of, of talent. 
Uh, and so what we did was we tried to get really creative. I mean, we partnered with fellowships, like whether it's the Aspen Institute or other healthcare fellowships, we, we partnered with some of the people that had been running those fellowships over the years that were deliberately diverse communities um, to build our hiring pipeline. Um, I think that we're a group of people that know how to figure out things that are really hard and, um, and to be innovative. So um, just making sure that for every open role, and conversely, when you're searching to meet entrepreneurs, you can be deliberate about saying, I am being intentional about expanding my network, I'm particularly interested in, in making in building relationships with, with underrepresented um, you know, backgrounds in our industry. Let me know if you if you have anyone I should meet. People are really scared to do that at first, but I've seen it work. Um, those are such some initial steps to take. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I think you know, Initialize did an open search both for, you know, partners and principals earlier this year. And I, my, my takeaway from that process was like, you know, I think a lot of people just assume, you know, it, it's not, you know, that like, I'm going to, I'm going to get diversity and like, I'm going to state that out loud as a goal and it will magically, you know, happen or, you know, because I want it, but it's actually, you know, it, it is a lot of work that you have to put into it, but it's worth it. Right. You know, and I think going into it, realizing you have to put work into it and you can't just, you know, be like, yes, bring me, bring me the people, <laughs> you know, bring me the diversity. It does, it doesn't work that way. And I think if you go and saying like, yeah, I have to go and help find people or reach out or, you know, do, put some effort into this, you get really great results but you know i think that that's the part we don't speak about a lot where you know the, there is work that you have to put it's into it. it it's it's you know there's a lot of there's a lot of things to do and more firms should you know i think you know that's easy to get overwhelmed with like too many emails or too many you know too many of the same candidates that are applying you you even with the open search i still had to have a your person reach out to people you know they, they didn't naturally think even with an open search that they could apply or that it applied to them you know you still had to go into those networks and try to find people um, who had different backgrounds so um, you know that's that's really that what you're saying really resonates with me i guess yeah, it um, takes resources and money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, time, and you got to get it in support from other people on your team and be like, yeah, okay, great. This is taking, you know, this is taking some more time and effort to like, you know, cast a wider net to find like different types of people than the ones that are going to naturally just apply, you know, online because they saw the the job or the opportunity. So um, that's that's sort of something that's not mentioned a lot that I think is um, kind of worth knowing about going in. <laughs> um. Okay, so I guess for, we'll go to um, maybe Chauncey next. Um, you know, I guess, you know, when people are raising money and they, they need to choose the, their VCs, you know, sometimes you, you have a lot of options and sometimes you, you know, maybe have, have fewer options, but you still, the choice is still, you know, very important. You know, what do you, what advice would you give um, founders and, and, and folks like that, that, um, you know, have to figure out who makes the most sense to put onto their, their cap table? Totally. Um, I would also, I'd say it's like a lot of uh, similarities to a recruiting process too. So if you're going, if you're a founder and you're starting a fundraising process and you're building out the pipeline of people you want to talk to, I think it's taking that lens too in the pipeline and being like, who, like, what does the diversity of the investor base that I'm looking to even start my initial conversations with? Like, is there a chance that I'm going to choose like a female lead or a person of color who's going to lead if they're not even on the list of people you're going to start talking to. Um, and I know that there is a dearth of both of those things in the industry, but I'm like bullish that more and more women and people of color are being put in check writing positions because of all the things we said, because I think that um, we will outperform a lot of other investors because we see things differently. And so I think from even just starting from that foundational place of treating it like a uh, like almost like a sourcing project of just making sure that there's diversity in the pipeline of investors you'll speak to. And then when we usually give the advice to our companies when they're going for follow on fundraising that we think about it as person firm terms, like firms usually collapse on each other and are very similar. You want a good firm that has great partners across the board in case your partner for whatever reason may leave the firm. And then at the end of the day, you're picking um, you're choosing someone to have a relationship with for the next seven to 10 years, likely. Um, and so you want to make sure that that person challenges you, asks you questions that you may not have th thought of. And that's why I think diversity in, in thought is so important there. And so different backgrounds um, really represent that. And I think that fundraising, uh, um, going through a fundraising process, if you look at that as an opportunity of 
talking to a lot of different types of people, like they're going to ask you questions that you didn't think about your business, you know, that like they're just going to bring a different lens. So even using that process as an opportunity to poke holes in your business and and then you might choose a partner who you may not have thought would have been the per- per- best person for it. Um, and then once you've selected a person, I do think it's really important right out the gate to start talking about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion right out the gate, where it's like, I want to bring um, angels onto the cap table, like, please give me a list and then be very specific and be like, I want a diverse set of backgrounds and um, ethnicity. And then also just keep asking people in your network to like, call it out. Like, if you don't, if you feel that your network doesn't have that, the diversity you're looking for, like, I think asking others for help, like, I jump at the chance. And like, sort of going back to Candace's point earlier on like BC and how we end up changing the industry. I think it's also to recognize that it's such a network heavy industry that if you're going to an event and, or if you're speaking on a panel, like you need to use your voice to be like, Hey, I'm so thankful for you for inviting me to this panel. However, I recognize that I'm the only like woman or I'm the only person of color. And I thought these three people would be great additions to the panel and being comfortable with like, calling it out and then also helping those people make better changes. So that's awesome. I love those. I love the suggestions. And I think it comes down to you feeling okay to ask even, even in the last, uh, the last panel or the last uh, presentation we saw, it's, it's all about like, if you're curious about it, it it's okay. To, you know, it's probably fine to ask about it. So you know, feel okay asking, you know, you won't get in trouble. <laughs> Um, and then I guess touching on, you know, sort of what, what, what you were just saying, I think then, you know, it's how do we get more, you know, women and, and underrepresented folks in the decision making spot, you know, and so maybe over to you, Sheena, you know, how can we get more of those folks uh, to become VCs since it's, you know, it's, except for a couple of our cases, it's hard to figure out like how to get in and, and you know, yeah, how do you get promoted and, you know, how do you get to the top of that, how do you get to the sort of check writing state? Yeah, absolutely. You know, venture is a is a long game in terms of building your career. And I think the sense that I've gotten is it really starts in the first early year or two to be able to really make sure that women and underrepresented folks on the team are taking on and learning all aspects of the role. I've noticed this a handful of times. There was a deal team of two or three, maybe women due to a confidence gap will take on doing competitive analysis or market research, and they may let the guy on the team handle the model. And they're concerned about being able to they don't want to mess up and we don't want to mess up and put, we put ourselves in a vulnerable position. And so I think the only words of caution I would uh, encourage is make sure that you take on sort of all aspects of the role and put in the extra work early on to do, to learn all of it. Cause you can't be a well-rounded partner unless you've done all of it early on. And so my biggest sort of source of encouragement is start early, learn all aspects of the job, and then just continue to demonstrate that over time as you continue to build your career. Um, and, you know, you just don't want women to pigeonhole themselves or underrepresented groups to pigeonhole themselves into certain aspects of the role. Um, I think it's just really important to be well-rounded. Yeah, that's, um, that's really great advice. I think, um, you know, from initialized, we have mostly former operators. So that's another, I think, great place if you're, if, you know, if you're really good at what you do at a, at a, you know, at a startup, you kind of start to become known amongst, you know, who invested in that startup and, and you know, start to build those relationships as well, because a lot of times investors worked at portfolio companies uh, that 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 a particular firm invested in um, uh, as well. And that's a, that's sort of a, a route that is very common, but I think very opaque to people. They're like, how do I how do I be, you know how do I get a like, get access to a venture firm? And you know that that's another way to like it doesn't matter what you're really good at at, at a at a startup, um, you know, or if you're a former founder and you founded a startup and, you know, you're, you're kind of ready for your next thing, that's, that's another great, I think, way to um, start to break into VC. Um, okay, so we all work at VCs. We're advising founders. <laughs> There's a large part of our job. Um, uh, and I guess, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, when, it, when the company is very small, I think a lot of us focus on the earlier stages as well. You know, it's really easy to accidentally fall into like having, you know, hiring your friends and having like 10 of the same people uh, working. And then, you know, how do I get like 
the first woman to start or you know the first person of color to, to join this group after it gets you know after it gets too homogenous so uh, maybe i'll go over to you candace and if others want to join in too it's just you know what's what's the piece of advice that you give founder at that stage of you know hey I, i'm moving quickly and i need to hire people but you know like, how do i you know where do i start to not not just like accidentally accidentally i'm gonna put that in quotes but you know end up with you know 10 of the mm-hmm. same type of person right away yeah gosh um i'm it's yeah understanding just how hard people are just <laughs> giving it their all at that very early stage and how quickly things are moving and how quickly companies are multiplying i was on a call with one of our um portfolio companies this morning and like last I heard they were 30 people they're over 200 now you know this is <laughs> um it, it is such a, a, an intense environment and then also from a you know people to have infrastructure and even cash standpoint um you have to be sensitive about what what a company can do or build or afford and a lot of things focused on equity diversity and inclusion like a lot of consultancies or tools might be more expensive made for bigger large larger scaled companies and you don't necessarily want to throw that in your early stage founder space, but you want to find a way for them to, to start to build. So um, you already, um, Jen, touched on the most obvious thing, which is hiring. And that's usually where people um, start to start to ask, okay, I got to build fast, but how do I also build in diversity? Um, and it goes back to what we've been talking about um, uh, around finding some of those partnerships and sources of diverse talent very early um, on. And when I say diverse talent, I mean groups of people, um, underrepresented talent, what have you. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that's a really obvious part. I think some, you know, I think something that people forget sometimes though is when you're building that team initially, um, being really intentional about building an inclusive culture. So um, I sat down with one of our companies that um, was a dozen people, and uh, we focus very much on um, building some of their culture and values and um, making sure that those values incorporated inclusion and then talk, speaking with the leadership team about how they would enact those values and remind people of those values so that it wasn't just like a sitting document collect, collecting dust. Um, but I think that that is something that people also don't necessarily think about um, you are thinking about culture from like swag and morale and the business you're going to grow and disruption, but you can also build inclusion into those messages. Um, and that leads me into uh, kind of the third piece, which is where does inclusion fall in your business strategy? Like, is it, if you're a consumer company, like, are you building for everyone, the customers that you're going to touch? If you're, even if you're an enterprise company focused on software, like, are those algorithms fair? Or is there bias in the ML, et cetera? Um, if you're in health tech, you know, who are you serving and how do people have access to what you're building? Start thinking about it from the product services side of things just as much as you were thinking about the team and what you're building side of things. And that will guide you to find experts, maybe external advisors, as well as internal people um, that can have you thinking about this ongoing. Amazing. And yeah, I, I think one of the things I usually tell founders in this in this realm too is like if you don't if you wait too long, it just becomes really, really hard, you know. So like well, why make it really difficult for yourself later on when you when you you know want it to be easy and it's less work up front. So start start early. It's sort of like brushing your teeth, like you know, do it, do it now, <laughs> often. Don't don't wait, you know, and be like, oh no, now I haven't brushed my teeth for 10 years. What happened? Um, disaster anyway my horrible, horrible analogy there, but um, all right. So I'm going to go, um, I guess maybe over to, to Chauncey, you know, how, how can startups adjust their hiring practice to, to even find diverse candidates? You know, um, Candace and I have hammered on, you need to get them, but you know, how, how do they actually um, do that? Yeah. And I mean, a lot of it, I'm actually probably stealing from things that I've heard from Candace speak, whether it's like on a podcast or an article, but like, I think one of the really important things early stage is that, um, starting with your values and using that values as a foundation in your hiring process and making sure that hiring process is very consistent experience for all candidates. Um, so I think first and foremost, getting your house in order of like, what is a candidate experience going to be like? What values are we interviewing for? Are we using consistent questions across candidates? Um, and then one interesting tactic we've done with our portfolio recently is that we've partnered with one of our portfolio companies, Top Funnel, which is a services and sort of like applicant tracking system. And we as the VC have been using them to like build candidate pipelines for our portfolio companies or specifically around engineering hires, which we know is something that's like very top of mind for early stage companies. 
And when we work with a partner, so anytime you're an early stage founder and you're looking for leverage, it's just making sure that they know these are things that are important to you. You know, it, writing something out in the job description. And then if you're working with any service provider, being very specific about like, you know, we want to make sure that there's like a, a 50-50 balance in gender and that underrepresented people are in, in our pipeline. Because if you start with a pipeline that is very homogeneous and then you're not, you're going to have a very homogeneous outcome likely. Um, and then uh, lastly, I think it's just partnering with other organizations like Candice was saying is just reaching out to organizations like Girls Who Code and say like, we are hiring for this role, like please post it and making sure that the the job is available online so anyone could see it. So I think there's a lot of tactics which I know Candice, you're, you're, you're the superstar at all of these things, but um, just, you know, making sure as venture partners ourselves that we're making sure that we're telling our companies like best practices and helping them uh, give the best candidate experience and the best outcome for building their early stage team. Um, okay, and I'm going to go one last question before we go to the Q&A, and that's to Sheena, um, which is how can startups hold themselves accountable? I think, you know, we, we have all this talk, but how do we make sure it happens? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, you know, it, there's a different philosophy for a variety of different companies, but I think touching on some of the points in the conversation today, I think there's a few metrics that we can start to be more, um, or we can hold ourselves to. I think one, like looking at diversity, not in terms of age, gender, um, sexual orientation, but also thinking about schools, demographics, which geographies we're seeing candidates in just to really push ourselves that we're looking outside of Boston, New York, San Francisco that have very certain types of schools and people and socioeconomic statuses um, is something that I've been thinking a lot more about for our portfolio, specifically as we sort of move into a bit more of a virtual world. And then two, just really starting to look at layers below sort of leadership and better understanding what retention is looking like across different across these dimensions as well. You know, my philosophy has always been that more junior candidates always Always want to be able to look up to leadership team and be able to identify with someone that they would like to grow into. So just making sure that there's folks around the table that really feel like that for you as a role model um, is something that's consistently important. And that's tracked with retention. That's tracked to acceptance rate for jobs. That's that's attached to conversion uh, for promotion over time. So just you know, I think unpacking and tracking those is helpful and you know should come up at you know in your sort of quarterly board meeting ideally as well but plenty more to be done. And I'm by no means an expert. <laughs> Thanks, Gina. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Grace, who's gonna lead the, the Q&A side of things. Awesome, thanks so much, Jen. Um, we have a ton of questions, so little time, but um, we're gonna go with some of the questions that were liked in the chat. So first question, and this is open to the panel. What is the best strategy um, or steps you can take while building your startup as a founder to make it perfect for raising funds? I can, I can take that one maybe. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, you know, depends what stage you're at, but yeah, early stage, it's, it's a couple of things. Um, you know, one is just whether, like, how are you as a founder really uniquely capable of tackling the problem that you're, you're, you're tackling? Like what unique knowledge or experience uh, do you have about, you know, the, the, the issue that's, that's going to make it so, so that you, you know, you're going to win. Um, the second part, I think VCs look very, very much at what's the market. So what's the total opportunity uh, of, you know, of, of, of the business you're proposing? There's a lot of businesses that are great. They'll be profitable business. They, you know, sometimes we call them quote lifestyle businesses, but, you know, to, to be venture funded, we're, we're, you know, we're looking for, you know, 100x return eventually, you know, on what we're, we're investing, you know, over time, over 10 years, right? So you really have to kind of make that that case for how you're either expanding the market, creating a new market, you know, the market's already so large and, you know, underserved. And, you know, there's a lot of themes that we talked about here today that, you know, under underrepresented folks maybe know about certain markets that aren't thought about today, but, you know, those, those to me are sort of the two pieces. Um, as you get a little bit later to sort of knowing your metrics and like how you're going to, um, you know, sort of win or win the market is also, I think, an important part. And I don't know if any others want to chime in on that as well. Yeah, I think I, I think that um, it's a it's a it's a pretty big question. And I, I love the way you broke it down um, by stage. But yeah, very early, for example, um, who's the founding team, right? Um, do does the team work well together? Does does the founder show awareness of 
opportunities, but also potential threats. How will you win the market? That kind of, you know, product market fit thing, but it's a lot team up front. And then as you kind of move into um, your revenue making phase, you have that audience that's that's so excited about your product and did you then see that path to path to revenue. Um, and, you know, this ties into one of the things we we're talking about um, as people move into the industry. And I think, Jen, you mentioned that there are a lot of people who are operators who are investors that initialized, um, but a lot angel investing has been really, really helpful in another like amazing path into, into a broader set of women understanding um, both from a founder perspective and from an F investor perspective, perspective what hits. I just add to what Jen and Candace said also is that when you're out raising, you're a storyteller, like you are telling the narrative of why someone needs to invest in this incredible company and why you're the person to um, to build it. And so I would say practice, practice, practice. Um, you know, if you're practicing with friends or family, anyone in your network, and afterwards you ask them, um, would you invest? If they say yes, like you probably nailed the story. If they say yes, but it means that you probably still have some questions to uh, answer. And if they say no, I think you have bigger problems. But like, it just, I think that a lot of this is, uh, you know, investors get a very brief moment in time to spend with you and you want to make a connection, tell your story, and then also like show that you're going to be a CEO leader that people want to join the company for. So it's a lot to, you know, a lot to package in in a short amount of time. But I would say the more you practice and sort of outline the milestones you want to achieve with that round of funding, the, I think the better outcome in your process you'll have. Great advice. Love that. Um, so this, this next question um, is, is kind of um, two, but um, um, the question is, what are some of the key, um, not necessarily spoken about considerations you may make when you are looking at investing in startups outside the U.S.? What would you say the top three things, somewhat like, um, uh, audience member based in South Africa would need to make sure of to be offshore investor ready. Well, we initialized this focus on US and Canada. So I don't know if this is a great question for me. I don't know if anyone else does international. No, it looks like no. Uh, okay. So I, you know, that's the thing, you know, mo most, uh, a lot of uh, US based investors have a certain charter where they're limited where they can invest in. Um, so definitely research that beforehand. So you're not contacting people who just can't invest at all. Um, you could be a, you know, a US based can you you'd be uh, outside the US be a Delaware Corp and registered in the US and then you know, investor could look at you. Uh, I think the, the I would say like some of the concerns we have on like, you know, outside of our market is just, you know, do we you know, are we able to even help that company and advise them if we don't understand that market or, you know, we don't have a network to help help them with there, even just, you know, a lot of what we do for companies is help them find candidates, help them find customers, you know, help them kind of like understand certain dynamics in the market. And if the VC doesn't have that much experience in there, it's not necessarily a great match. So that's what I would sort of say, like find a VC that sort of has, does have some expertise in your market that can offer that to you and not just try to find someone, you know, because they happen to be a US-based VC. I think exactly what Jen said is also working backwards. If like there are breakout companies in your ecosystem, go figure out who were their backers because uh, then you already know that they're investing in that ecosystem. We do some international investing, um, but we're very thesis focused around um, following like fintech enterprise companies that we've invested in the US and then doing those in emerging markets. Um, so it's, I think it's like going to the portfolio and just seeing if that firm has some connectivity or a thesis around um, investing in that market. Awesome, uh, moving on to the next question. Uh, which I think is a very important question. We touched on motherhood in the context of building out a venture or carving out a path for oneself in um, an out of professional choice. What are the three keys, three key things you would say founders um, who are also mothers should know early on in building out their ventures? In a world where not everyone has another full-time um, job parenting, how can one be best leverage parenthood experience or their average uh, or their advantage in building and scaling a business? Well, one thing I'll say off the bat is, um, you know, um, one of our areas that we, and not saying obviously that this needs to be the area that the founder is investing in, but we um, 
we have a pretty growing women's health um, cross-functional group. We've just surpassed 100 million invested in um, companies focused on um, women's health, but also more broadly, you know, whether it's reproductive health, like, um, you know, uh, wellness and body. Um, it's actually much like if we're doing a panel on this. I'm going to, I'm actually going to invite everyone. We're going to be doing a panel on this in July with a couple of our companies, but let me not use this space to do that shameless plug. Um, it's, uh, but it's an, it's a growing area. And I think the underrepresentation of women historically in venture is why this hasn't been as venture backed as it's becoming over time. Um, so, um, the, the founders that are involved in that conversation, I mean, they are obviously, you know, pretty open about a number of their experiences, even if they're not directly related to um, reproductive health. Um, but I would say a takeaway from all of it is um, if you are in, in the vein of finding that good person and that investor that's going to represent you, um, being able to share your story and speak very proudly of, you know, your life as a parent is really important in that investor fit. If you feel like you need to cover or adjust or, or minimize that part of your life, that's probably a, a signal um, that you haven't found the, the perfect partner yet. Um, uh, I'm a mother, I'm a mother of two and switch firms when I was uh, pregnant with my second child. And it was actually very important to me when I was joining a new fund, um, to have a conversation with my partner very early on that I was pregnant and that I would be likely going on leave, which luckily we developed a, a parental leave strategy with me joining. Um, but, uh, and my first investment was an employee leave management platform called Cocoon. So it helps employers with, uh, managing, parental bereavement, a medical caregiving leave. Um, so something I'm very passionate about, but one thing that I've I've loved as being um, an investor who's also a parent is having these open conversations with founders. And I'm not no means equating what it, being an investor and being a founder is like, but I've loved connecting the parents in, in my portfolio in particular to talk about family planning, to talk about the challenges of starting an early stage company. And so the one thing I am, and bullish on is that I, I think of my two years of check writing, I feel like three or four people have already had babies. So I feel like that a lot of people are starting companies and having families at the same time. And I think that it enriches your life in so many ways and gives you space and probably inspires what you're doing at your company. So um, it's by, in by no means easier, but I think a lot of us are feeling a lot more comfortable being vulnerable and having these conversations around the hardships and um, and, uh, how we can just be our best selves. So, um, yeah. I'm, I'm not a parent, but I just want to say that like being a startup and a, or, or an executive or a founder is all about prioritization and really the, all the parents I know are really, really good at that. <laughs> like they know how to optimize their time to, down, you know, to make it super efficient. And it's not about working around the clock. It's, it's about like really you know, doing the smartest things with your time and knowing what's the most high leverage. And I think people who are parents really build that skill. <laughs> and they're, they're forced to, but they're very good at that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, um, everyone on the panel. Thank you, Jen, Chauncey, Candice, you know, for sharing your experiences and just really giving um, really actionable and valuable like advice um, to folks who are listening and watching. I know we have over 400 and 60 folks in here. So I know everything you were saying is very key. So thank you so much for being on this panel and just sharing your, your journey and your experience.